I'm Ashton Addison from BlockWest Capital for Investment Pitch Media, and today on the Crypto Coin Show, we have back with us Nick Odio, the Chief Growth Officer of Ferrum Network. Nick, welcome back, and great to see you again. Yeah, great to see you again too, Ashton. Thanks so much for having me, man. You're very welcome. I know a lot's been going on at the Ferrum Network. Uh, your team has been expanding, preparing for the mainnet launch, and there's different stages that I'd love to discuss through. Um, but for the viewers who haven't seen our previous videos, I think the last one was at the beginning of 2023. Uh, I would love to just start off with, you know, what exactly is the Ferrum Network working on and what have your team and you have been doing since then? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, it's, it, let's take this kind of like as a, as a two, two part answer. Um, the two things that we're focusing most on right now at Ferrum are the mainnet which we're building using Substrate. Um, so we're leveraging Polkadot's consensus um, to uh, secure a parish chain um, and, then, and then operate our multi-chain messaging engine on top of uh, Polkadot's consensus. So that's in full swing right now. We uh, actually just uh, launched our testnet to Rococo, which is Polkadot's testnet, which was big news for us. Um, and... Uh, and, and 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 then the other thing that we're heavily focused on right now is multi-swap. Multi-swap is our multi-chain DEX aggregator that we've been working on for some time now. Um, we're looking to uh, enter the next phase of um, like a public beta at the end of the month. Um, and um, basically that's going to be as close to the public launch as you can get without it being really called the, the, the main net launch. But all of the the features and everything will be um, accessible uh, on on multi swap by the end of the month at wow. the latest beginning of July. So um, those two things are um, like have been our main focus. Now, in order to uh, in enhance the features, enhance the mm -hmm. um, the usability of mainnet and of and of multi swap, we've done something really exciting. We've launched our DAO. Um, so now uh, FRM is a true governance token. Uh, we're now putting the responsibility of the decision making into the hands of the community, um, democratizing, decentralizing the way that we make decisions at Ferrum, um, the way that we propose ideas at Ferrum. Um, and so this is something that we've been wanting to do for a long time now, uh, just weren't really in a position to uh, to do so, oftentimes projects start off in a little bit more of a centralized manner and then move towards decentralization over time. And we felt like this, you know, given the 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 um, given the updates regarding mainnet and and multi swap, we figured this was the proper time to officially launch the DAO and make Ferrum make FRM a true governance token. So, yeah, that's been the biggest news lately. Um, we've got a few proposals circulating right now where people are actually voting um, on Snapshot and we're using Discord as the hub for all the the, the, the um, conversation around proposal suggestions and things like that. And it's been really fun to see activity in, in that field. Um, so, yeah. Wow. Very cool. And I want to dive into that DAO part a little bit more. Uh, but first, I, I you mentioned, you know, the, the multi-swap, which is something that I think is going to change the entire blockchain industry. So I want to touch on that first because I feel like it's really important, especially with the latest news around you know exchanges sort of being uh, pursued for you know trading, being custodians of other people's assets and, and trading. And that's what most people are used to. You know, they go to Binance or Coinbase, and and if you want to switch Bitcoin to something on the Ethereum blockchain or something on uh, a Binance Smart Chain. You know, you, you're using a centralized party for that, um, but now they're sort of cutting off the, those rails. And I feel like uh, DeFi and multi swaps and decentralized uh, asset trading is going to be the future. There's a lot. There seems to be some barriers to entry where it's just not as easy as it is on on Binance. But at the same time, you have to give up your private keys and your assets to somebody else. Um, what What do you think? Do you th What do you think about the timing of uh, what's happening it, with digital asset trading and having a multi-swap function come in at this time. Yeah, no, I think um, every time things like this happen where regulators, governments from around the world start pursuing specific assets or specific exchanges or platforms, um, 
it serves as a reminder to get your uh, tokens off of centralized exchanges, get them off um, um, custody uh, or put them into self custody uh, wallets. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, this is no different and this is a big one, you know, the SEC is going after finance and presumably Coinbase. So um, we need to uh, take that as a, as a sign and, and start moving towards, the ethos of web three, the, like the whole premise of web three was around um, self custody and around decentralization and, and circumventing these, these middlemen that serve as banks for us and being your own bank. And so, you know, this is just uh, the nature of the game, right? This is a, this is bound to happen when you're kind of trying to circumvent some of these, uh, some, some of these regulators and, and, um, custody uh, custodians and things like that so um yeah then you know to to the other part of your question how does multi-swap play a role here well multi-swap allows you to swap any asset for any asset on any network to any wallet right so um you can essentially take your matic tokens on polygon and swap them for ethereum on ethereum right um you, you could swap any token on Binance Smart Chain for any token on, uh, you know, we're, we're integrating the Cosmos ecosystem right now. So even non-EVM compatible networks, we've done swaps between Kepler Wallet and MetaMask. So two totally different blockchains, two totally different um, virtual machine environments, you know, uh, and and um, and have approved these transactions on, on two different wallets. And so that's, you know, that's fully um, up and running now something really exciting that that we've built over at ferrum um and so yeah like uh you've got your 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 metamask wallet you're holding your assets on metamask you've got a kepler wallet you've got a you know say like a sub wallet or one of the polka dot wallets you can hold all of your assets on these different networks and swap them to and from um without having to go through any sort of um centralized exchange or, or anything like that now the the problem that we're facing is how do you have on and off ramps for these assets right um and that's where centralized exchanges have played the biggest role is like mm -hmm. um you know uh being able to exchange these currencies for cash or for fiat right um now i'm currently in el salvador i'm in bitcoin beach right now and for the last uh for the last few days i've been paying for everything in bitcoin so Incredible. i don't need it on ramp i don't need to um you know swap my my bitcoin or my ferrum tokens or whatever i mean i never sell my ferrum but um <laughs> you know for, for for cash you know i don't i don't need to, to sell any crypto for for cash because i'm paying in crypto right mm -hmm. so that's the point we need to get to governments mm -hmm. need to follow suit with what naive did over here in el salvador and recognize bitcoin and other currencies as, mm -hmm. as tender so that we don't need to um mm -hmm. have fiat uh, on and off ramps we can just switch over to using crypto it's crazy i went to this like little tienda this little store last night it's basically someone's house you know um to buy like some like you know some, some snacks and because everywhere else was closed and they didn't accept card but they accepted Bitcoin, you know, wow. everywhere here accepts it. So we need, we need more countries to follow suit like mm -hmm. that, so that we don't have to worry about how am I going to on ramp mm -hmm. or how am I going to off ramp my crypto? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that's really cool, Nick. And I feel like that on ramp off ramp is, uh, it's part of the part that the, the SEC or the regulators are worried about. It's when you actually go back to the fiat cash. And I saw, Binance US, one of the uh, one of the things that they're doing to try and resolve this issue was to remove the USD from their exchange so that it's only crypto. Um, so you know if you remove you know trading into USD and withdrawing to your bank account, then there's less regulations to worry about. But then you're stuck with Bitcoin or some other asset. You know how do you uh, you have to get people to accept the Bitcoin um, if you want to use it to actually pay your rent or buy groceries right yeah. right yeah and, and and i think the countries that are like the most under the thumb of the u.s dollar are the ones that are the quickest to to want to mm -hmm. um recognize bitcoin as, as tender and so it starts with countries like el salvador and argentina you know like i was in argentina too and like they're you know their currency was 
experiencing like hyperinflation when I was there. I was there for three months and the inflation was 300% in the three months that I was there. So you can't even hold Argentinian pesos for more than a week without experiencing, you know, some major devaluation of your, of your, of your money. So they have an app there called Lemon where basically you hold stable coins and you swipe this debit or credit card and it immediately transfers those stable coins into mm. the value of in pesos at that given moment. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting um, traveling through Latin America uh, and seeing um, people using crypto out of necessity rather than as a speculative asset, mm -hmm. right? Like in the U S we use it like, okay, I'm going to invest and I'm going to, have I'm going to experience appreciation of this asset and then I'm going to sell it for fiat mm -hmm. here or in, in a lot of Latin American countries, they're using it because they have no other choice. And so mm -hmm. you see people that would have never otherwise understood crypto, um, you know, little old ladies running like little like tiendas, you know, that they're accepting Bitcoin, you know, like it's, yeah. it's crazy. So, and, but uh, being in the country and I, from what I understand, El Salvador was the first, if not one of the first to make Bitcoin legal tender. Uh, do you yeah. actually see a positive impact on uh, the people in the country? You know, they're accepting it. They're actually better off. Um, and, you know, if other countries follow suit, then will the citizens that live inside the country actually be better off using this over their fiat currency? Well, you know, I think the more mediums of exchange that they have access to, the better, because, you know, for example, this like little tienda that I went to last night to, if, if I didn't have um, Bitcoin, I, I didn't have cash at the moment. So I wouldn't have been able to pay. I wouldn't have been able to purchase the things that I wanted to, to, to purchase mm -hmm. uh, if they didn't accept, since they didn't accept card. But because they accepted Bitcoin and I didn't have cash, I could pay in Bitcoin. So, like, I think it definitely um, enhances economic activity. Mm. Um, and that's just one anecdote, right? Like, I'm sure that kind of stuff happens all the time. Mm. Um, so, I think anytime that you're increasing economic activity, mm. that's a benefit for any economy, right? So, um, that in, in that regard, I definitely think it's... Um, it's been a, a positive had a positive impact uh on el salvador now um there's other things that they're doing like they're mining bitcoin using geothermal energy from a volcano so people often say like um you know uh we uh we, bitcoin's bad for the environment right mm -hmm. okay yeah everything takes energy but also there are renewable energy sources out there i was recently in guatemala and every form of energy there is renewable it's either geothermal solar wind or hydro they don't have any no coal no you know it's all renewable um energy so you know the way that el salvador is mining bitcoin with geothermal energy you can't really have that same argument well bitcoin takes takes energy proof of work is bad for the environment if you're if you're doing it with a uh, through through renewable means so that's another thing that i think they're, they're doing correct um and that i think is going to have a positive impact because essentially they're just they're mining bitcoin for free mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um incredible so yeah. but one yeah. one thing that i noticed in some of the latin american countries i'm not sure if this is uh, across the board but often they're not trading on the layer one Bitcoin network, you know, to purchase uh, $2 worth of, you know, uh, tacos at the taco stand. They have to use yep. layer two networks or lightning networks, something like that. Um, yeah. In the case of uh, with Ferrum as well, when you're doing swaps, it seems like there's becoming an abundance of layer two networks, not just on Bitcoin, but Ethereum and all these other ones. <clears throat> Is that part of the plan to also incorporate other networks as they grow? Yeah, so I think, you know, the thing that's the, the really cool part about Ferrum is that, uh, you know, our whole MO is connecting these different isolated networks that that exist separately from each other currently, right? So like um, you've, you've got applications and financial instruments that live on Solana, you've got some that live on Ethereum, you've got some that live on, you know, avalanche and cardano and what have you but they can't really exist across multiple across multiple networks right so 
um, where Quantum Portal comes in with Ferrum's mainnet with our multi-chain messaging engine, um, mm-hmm. that's Quantum Portal is Ferrum's multi-chain messaging engine that is going to be residing on um, using Polkadot's consensus, right, as a parachain. Um, we're leveraging what's called XCM, which is uh, um, Polkadot's um, cross-chain messaging uh, kind of palette, so if you will, mm-hmm. to en- enable the movement of arbitrary information and data and messaging across these different networks. So there are components of both layer ones and and layer twos within this within this framework um, that will you know that that will make it easier for. Um, uh, you know, for us to transact across different environments. So, uh, hmm. so yeah, I think that's, that's one of the exciting, and I, you know, w- what that implies is yet to be determined, right? Like there's, we, we have, we can theorize about the, the, the implications of that, but it's really going to come down to what people decide to build using this environment um, before we realize it's true potential. You know, like when the internet was created, nobody foresaw the email and then nobody foresaw social media, Right. So like we're building the, the tools for people to go out and build really cool stuff. And I'm really excited to see what people come up with. Yeah, no, that's very exciting. And from what I understand, the Polkadot uh, infrastructure and the ecosystem is very advanced in, you know, the cross chain messaging and like having a layer zero, much more advanced than Ethereum, where things that are built on top of it don't actually have to rely on, uh, you know, the the parent network. Like if, if Ferrum was right. launching... On, on Polkadot and then something happened to Polkadot, you know, went down for a day, that wouldn't actually affect uh, the functionality of Ferrum Network if it was running on the substrate technology. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, you know, the other the other kind of benefit that you get from from using Polkadot's consensus is that you don't have to go out and create your own consensus mechanism, which any standalone layer one is having to do right now. They're, oh, should we do a proof of work? Should we do proof of stake? Should, mm-hmm. you know, how are, and that that's probably the the most uh, laborious um, part of the process when creating a network. So being able to leverage um, a layer zero like Polkadot's consensus m- makes it much easier for us to focus on um, the features of of the network and creating what you know what in the Cosmos ecosystem they call it app chains, right? Application specific networks. So. Um, I think layer zeros were probably, you know, some of the best thing, one of the best things to happen to crypto in a long time for that reason. Awesome. And I want to jump back to the DAO now because you mentioned at the beginning and I feel like this is a, it's good timing for it. You know, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of founders of layer one networks and they agree that, you know, you, the, the core team sort of built up the vision, built up the foundation of the platform and then you slowly you know, release it into a DAO structure where you can get the community involved and all of a sudden they shape it. Uh, whereas some projects that start to start from a DAO in day one, you know, they don't, it's, it's hard to have a million different voices shouting at each other, you know, how should we build the, the foundation of this? And it's a little bit chaotic. So I feel like this is yeah. a nice approach that your team has done in moving over to a DAO structure. And I'm curious, um, see the people that uh, have been involved or following along with Ferrum for the past, uh, you know, years. Uh, they are, they're the only ones that can get involved or how do people that are just hearing about the video, they haven't used Ferrum or touched it. How can they start getting involved in the DAO right now? Yeah. So it's cool. Uh, good question. Everyone, anyone can get involved in the DAO, right? Um, if you have one Ferrum token staked in Crucible, you are, you can claim the qualified voter tag on discord and you can start um voting on um these like early stage proposals right through something called we 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 have kind of a couple different phases of of the the life cycle of the proposal right initially it just starts off with a proposal suggestion then we kind of gauge the interest um with something called a pulse check which um if we get a certain amount of um yes votes for that proposal in Discord, that'll then it'll actually go to Snapshot, um, and then you can actually vote using your tokens, and your vote will be weighted based on the amount of tokens that you have staked. So, um, but to answer your question, anyone can vote. Um, you, anyone can receive that qualified voter tag. All you have to have is one FRM staked. Now, if you want to create a proposal, 
there's uh you know we've we've implemented some security measures to prevent things like governance attacks uh-huh. um, uh, so if you want to create a proposal yourself you have to have at least 450,000 CFRM staked in um, crucible um, now that basically was a, a, a mechanism for us to prevent governance attacks like you have to have skin in the game if you're going to create a proposal nobody with a you know that much frm is going to go create a malicious proposal that's going to end up hurting their investment mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so um governance is a tricky thing you know you have to really cr- dot your i's and cross your t's and uh and make sure that you're you, you know that you have mechanisms in place to prevent malicious activity and bad actors coming in creating malicious so um that was that was a, a security mechanism we put in place but yeah um if you want to create proposals then just go stake 450k <laughs> cfrm you want to vote you can vote with as little as one very cool i'll have to look into that on on coin gecko uh where can i get more cfrm um, yeah well you just yeah you get frm and then you just uh you mint cfrm with it through the crucible dashboard okay sounds great and yeah you mentioned that you know you're getting close to some of these stages of the mainnet. Uh, when that happens, does the proposal to go live go through the DAO and approved by the members, or how does that work with the DAO's involvement? Yeah, pretty much everything is going to be um, Ethereum request for comments, right? That's uh, what ERC twenty Ethereum request for comment. Mm. Uh, Proposal number twenty. That's where the token standard for Ethereum. That's the, you know, the naming convention behind any sort of proposal that gets passed through. Uh, so we're we've kind of taken on the same naming convention. FRC one was our election of DAO mods, mm-hmm. um, and then it'll just kind of go in that succession. Like so, FRC two, FRC three, and um, and then you know. With Ethereum, you also have things called EIPs, Ethereum Improvement Proposals, right? So those are actually improvements to the network. So we'll have FIPs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and those will be things like, yeah, like, do we do we launch the mainnet now? Should we add this to the mainnet? Um, you know, so that the, all these things are going to go through the DAO now, which is pretty cool. I think it's like, it's not only more democratized, mm-hmm. but it's also... It, I think it's more efficient and it's also like more robust in the sense that you're actually able to leverage the collective intelligence, Mm -hmm. which I think is one of the coolest things about decentralization is not just like relying on the core team members ideas, but actually being able to leverage um, community members who may be seeing it from a different perspective Mm -hmm. um, and, and leveraging that collective intelligence. So I think we'll see a lot more, a lot more flow of ideas going through the community now very cool and you mentioned the the discord is where there's discussion around the DAO. can people just join that uh you know prior to buying some frm and sort of see what's up and then take the steps to get involved yeah yeah definitely join our discord um the that's anyone can join the general chats and things um i think you can actually join the DAO chat too without having to hold any firm but in order to like view proposals, I believe, I believe you have to hold at least one FRM mm-hmm. uh, or stake one FRM. Yeah. So. Okay, sounds great. And is there any other place where people can learn more information about uh, the upcoming mainnet launch and also just how to get involved in the DAO? Yeah, I would say definitely follow along with our Telegram announcement channels. Follow us on Twitter. Um, we're very active on like uh you know updating the community on any sort of uh you know any sort of development when it comes to mainnet when it comes to multi-swap when it comes to dow proposals now now that's a big thing that we're like marketing now is like you know we've got proposals coming through you'll see a lot more news around like okay we've got this new proposal suggestion go join our discord go vote on it um but yeah i would say if you're on what we're all on twitter uh and um and then yeah join our discord and, and get involved in helping us make some decisions now <laughs> <laughs> 
Sounds great, Nick. Thank you so much for all the updates. I will also leave the, the Discord, the other social links, uh, ferrum.network in the description box below for the viewers. All the best with these DAO proposals moving forward to the launch of the mainnet. And I'm just excited to be able to multi-swap self-custody. Let's switch between all these blockchains and, and not have to worry about you know, these centralized exchanges. So thank you for you and your team on what you're doing. Uh, all the best with everything moving up to the launch and let's follow up in the near future. Awesome, Ashton. Thanks so much, man. Looking forward to the next time.